evening, and welcome to Dark Hour for Paranormal. I am your host, Michael Roser, and tonight, we're going to be talking once again to Jared Murphy, but this time, about some creative endeavors that he's put together fantastic documentary named Terracor, Our Ancient and Past Revealed, Discovering Our Lost History, and as I have mentioned on other shows that I have spoken about this already, my music is the score of the entire documentary. Folks, I'm very honored and always am to bring Jared onto the show. And he's been no stranger to this channel. He's been with us for, God, let me say about eight months now. It could have been longer, actually. And of course, he and I are very good friends. We talk very often. And this was a particular project that he, I believe, had in mind and really wanted to go at it. And trust me, it's a fantastic presentation. And again, it's going to be premiering tomorrow night on his channel, Terra Core, Our Ancient Past Revealed, Discovering Our Lost History. So, tonight we are going to be talking at length about his production and he's going to give us some insight into the content and why he chose to choose uh, why he chose to cover this subject particularly although very fascinating and most of you out there will think the same there's certain reasons I'm sure that we highlight things at one time or another Polly T I just wanted to address something with you very quickly I did not get bit by or bitten by a empire bat yes it is a late show but I work uh, between 50 and 60 hours a week at a day job, uh, and when I come back, this is the time slot that I have now filed into, and it's something that works in way of the show and, of course, the day job and seeing the rest of the family, and thus, this is probably what you're going to see more often than not, unless I have a day off like Wednesday, and I'll have, well, I have the night off, and I'll have Elisa Medhus here at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. You're going to see us otherwise at 11 o'clock or 11.30 or 12 o'clock Eastern Time, midnight. All right, guys? So, without further ado, as we love to say here on YouTube, I'm going to bring on Jared Murphy, and we're going to get into this conversation. Jared, what's going on, mate? How are you tonight? Thanks for coming on the show yet again. In for more hey. punishment, brother. <laughs> yeah, you know what? It's getting, one, thanks, two, we've been doing... I think that pause, like you said, you know, like reorganizing, reorganizing schedules and figuring things out so that we can uh, do different interviews with assorted guests and our, our fields of uh, exploration. You know, for everyone listening, it's like, we, you know, we're all trying to do more field work where we can bring you, you know, live research. And I, I think between our schedules of feeding this beast, I, I think we have I think we could positively share with people that there will be a time where you won't get us off uh, off air where eventually there has been some subsidizing of our craft and it eventually will lead to, you know, I guess we'll just be uh, Van Gogh and assorted other Monets and living out of a gypsy caravan and just doing full time. <laughs> hey, that's what we are going to do eventually and you guys do help us to get there. Obviously, by your donations, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for all the donations that you give to our channel. But also importantly, that you are here with us for the live shows and you check us out in the archives. We really appreciate that. And I've seen all of you in there that comment, and I appreciate what you say about the shows. Now, listen, Jared, let's get right yeah. into the meat of this. So tell me a little yeah. bit about, first, why you decided to choose this subject to cover and what your initial thought was going into creating this documentary? You know, I think it's been an evolution ever since I even wrote It's Not Aliens Worse, It's Us, Discovering Our Lost History. The, the evolution all along, uh, it's not an anxiety, but all along it's been how do you miss such a massive subject on a global scale as our ancient advanced past? And when you I, I i haven't figured it all out none of us have and i you know it would be i wish we could just do it in the next year or like in our lifetimes but there's so much information and pieces that fell together i'm like oh gosh how am i going to write this and say it without like you know skipping you know like talking too fast tripping over my own words mm -hmm. and all along it's like how do you bring people a, a full overview a fifty thousand foot view and say listen our past was very advanced. It's in our genes. It's in our ruins. It's in not just uh, forgotten math that 
and assorted out of place, out of time artifacts that if you just table the facts that there was a very advanced ancient human race uh, that we achieved higher than where we're at now. And it's like, how do you cram all that and bookend it into a conversation that people can grasp in one sitting where it, it, it doesn't even, and, and not only explain it, but then what are some of the missing techniques to explore and to discover this? And what are some of the things that archeologists and a uh, paleoanthropologist, just people study history haven't done. And I'm like, okay, I put the book out. We've been doing, you know, you and I've been co-hosting and going on adventures and all the stuff that is moving forward now with new work and new writing. And I'm like, look, we ha I have to pause and we have to like put something together for people to say, is there something instead of tripping over what Jared is talking about, what could we put and just say, hey, watch this 40 minute documentary. Mm -hmm. It's stuff nobody's been talking about. And it it then covers a little bit of all of it uh, from our kind of lost superhuman abilities, how it relates to megalithic construction and stone spheres and how does it come all together so that it's not only an overview, but it's a lot of deep information with visuals. And I think with combined with your music and with some voiceovers from Simon King from uh, the Silk Podcast, just all of it together was a chance for people to not only enjoy the ride, but, you know, hopefully, I, you know, the goal is to let people share it with other people and really maybe start shifting the paradigm about who and what we are and can be and our past. Now, this That's, is certainly, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. That's, I, is that like, too, that was too long of an answer? No, no. You know, you know how we do things around here. I mean, it's never yeah. too long. Um, you know, so this is certainly just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to researching and looking into our origin, perhaps some of the technology that we've possessed in the past to create some of these constructs that are left over. Um, do you have any plans on perhaps looking at some of this work as a segmented piece. So for example, on your next documentary, you may still address some of the same concepts, but you know, cover another part of that uh, area entirely. And yet when you look at some of these as they come out, they all sort of coincide. What is your overall vision here? Or does you it are, even expand you, that way? And as you've already pointed out to everyone, we are friends. So thank you for loading that question for me. <laughs> I will give an appropriate answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that is exactly right. What you guys just heard is the idea of this is wherever you are in the research, because everyone comes at it with their own experience. And we talk, I talk about everyone's own hunches or genetic memories and uh, personal experiences, you know, some part of this documentary and there is information throughout the whole thing. It's at no point, I think, is it uh, lacks for information where somebody might be drawn to a particular portion of it. But later when you go back, you're like, wait, now that I've come full circle on this piece, it connects to this other piece. And by having future documentaries that I'll put out along with all the other interviews that we do and some of the, we, we this is something that you and I and Gary from Everything Imaginable and there's a lot of people in Niche and Cosmic Salon. There's a lot of places where, you know, we're consistently having a collaborative conversation and your research and America's Stonehenge, everything we're doing are pieces of the same puzzle, whether it's paranormal or whether it's, uh, you know, I think it's an alien. The reality is that there is a piece of it that depending on where your personal experience is, if you start with this, I think this in mind, this documentary was going to be a baseline. And that baseline would say, okay, oh, I see how all this is not unrelated, that it is connected. And then the future ones will be like synestheses. Oh, mm -hmm. that's not, that wasn't exciting. Let me start with something else, like stone spheres. And everyone's like, okay, all right, they're wave and frequency and ball things. Yeah, but we're doing a little more experiment on what frequencies, what are they resonating at? Who's doing the material science research that figured out, as an example, one of the things in the, that I talked about was the mysterious bay that was found in Cadiz in the mm -hmm. Mediterranean. This is a bay that is ancient. And they said, oh, well, it's probably Roman. However, 
they did material science testing in Europe where they're a little more open-minded and the scientists figured out that there's like a Teflon like surfacing to this bay that's underwater and there's no barnacles. There's no buildup of any sea grime of any kind. And it's like, this is, and they're, they're specific in their testing and said, this is some high tech stuff. Well, stone spheres as an example are all over the earth and oh thank you third phase Appreciate hey that, the guys. boys are in the house third phase of moon is joining us tonight what's going on guys thanks for being here um, and I, i'd like to say very quickly a very special to uh, a very special hello to guy you know who you are what's going on brother hey guy i got a guy <laughs> um but the uh the, the idea would be is to refer to this documentary and say, oh, wow, overall subject matter, but the details are there. But then we'll go down that rabbit hole of consciousness with water, synesthesia abilities, engineered soils. There's There are researchers. And so, and, and as usual, there's, uh, I know it's trending right now, but disinformation. Mm -hmm. So there is, we've talked a lot about ancient engineered soils that are all over the earth. And then what's interesting to me in my research is I want to do a whole documentary just not only on, okay, what is engineered soils? We've said what it can do and its piezoelectric properties. And it seems to, you know, hundred times best growing soil. It seems to self-replicate. Uh, yeah, there's a professor that's really researching it in Kansas, but there are other papers out. And what's in interesting about disinformation is you have scientists that are saying, well, it does this, this, and this, and they're, they politely and cautiously say, well, it's going to need more study and mm -hmm. then they won't they won't assign it another value they won't assign it an age they won't do anything with carbon dating because it's really a giant elephant in the room as reference to like the total scalability of a worldwide society or nomadic peoples it's you know it makes no sense if you have a static engineered soil under a ground where only a certain group of people that were credited with migrating there 13 or 20 or 30,000 years ago, you that's not an explainable situation in the paradigm that, and the point isn't to break down the paradigm, the point is to start identifying our true history for that search and recovery. And so engineered soil is just one of those things where I think helping people discern more of the, the fog that they throw out where it's, it, that's important and you can see it in some of the, uh, you know, some of the reports, but so drilling between, oh, hey, here's what we think engineered soil could do. Here's what we know it can do. Here's a good example of people who are looking at it and maybe there's a way to support their research. So I'd like to get down that road eventually where we can actually start getting funds to the people who are willing to do the research. Mm -hmm. Like Dr. Gerald Pollack, you know, the fourth state of water, the man literally discovered another state of water and has a whole scientific wing that he sponsors privately to have people start and ask and question and run experiments that would never otherwise be sponsored in standard academic environments. And this is a man, I mean, it's one thing to discover a hydrogen bomb. This guy discovered a another state of water, which ties in Emoto Masuru's work, it ties into Victor Schauberger's, the naturalist's work, uh, the idea of structured water, Johann Grander, and not the woo-woo end of it, but there's something about water that we're only scratching the surface on what it can do. And being open to other experimentations, there's just these wings where we want to bring that information, but keep tying it to a baseline of how advanced were we, where are we going because of what we're rebooting? Not because we're discovering something new, but we're reactivating something that's very old. But this is such an uphill battle for you. Every angle that you turn, not only are you you know, seeking to go out to certain locations, you then have to either get permits or some sort of mission to, to excavate and look at this in an archaeological sense. This takes time, so that's another uphill battle. Then if you find something that goes against the grain, uh, you, know, you have to worry about how that information is going to be received or if you're even going to be able to hold on to it. I mean, this is such a very difficult thing to look at in way of a totality because of all of these challenges that are in front of you where do you think people are going to go when we start seeing more evidence of what you're putting forth and more of these theories starting to come together how easily do you think this is going to be interwoven into our consciousness and our awareness i i think that's uh there's a couple there's a there's a lot of layers to that it's a great question 
Um, and it even ties into the third phase. Uh, Brian Forster speaks about frequencies to meld rocks into liquid form. Uh, there was a paper and a debate, and there's actually video of this discussing the geopolymers of Tiwanaku and the uh, basically what is the formation of these? Were they forms? And, and what's interesting is, is that there's these famous H blocks, and this ties into the question. Mm -hmm. The H blocks, they found six. Well, the thing is, they don't dig at Tiwanaku because they figured it all out, even though there's layers and layers of mud. And Brian likes to point out that those H blocks are not all the same. They're all different. They're different sizes. But that only indicates that they found six, and it doesn't indicate that they weren't made from forms, which Dr. Joseph Davidovitz, the guy who created geopolymers, the father of geopolymers from the early 70s, has done the experiments and had a massive debate about the formation of these blocks and either the, the the legends and stories of the Inca talking about liquefying rock or the tr transmutation of just how you would make it malleable like a marshmallow, et cetera, et cetera, stuff like that. Those details and the scientists that are doing the material science work, I think are all the real rock stars that you know, we want to say something. We want to, like, during our interviews and when we do shows with people, we want to make some interesting observations about what's been found. But I also think the process and finding it is part of why people are drawn to watching these shows, like what we're doing. It's that, so, in, yeah, that internal, like, I have a hunch and I've never done anything with this and I'm an accountant or fill in the blank. And I, but there's everyone is connected collective con collective human consciousness is real personal genetic memory is real and i think that the combination of us making each other aware of the scientists that are doing work on it right now that really are the true rock stars on some of this stuff and discovering things are important finding things are important so there's a lot of different ways to uh, participate or be a part of the adventure but i do think that uh, bringing more conversation around the people doing the work and bringing awareness of their work, uh, helping fund some of that work, and also looking for new things to fund, which part of part of the documentary is about doing exactly that. How do we uh, umbrella all these pieces into a single coherent theory, and at the same time, be able to mix and match and piece an a la carte and buffet the theory uh, in and out to make it stronger for what does, and not about, what's going to make the theory work, but what are all the facts on the table and mm -hmm. how does that keep, that's the thing. If we, if we keep looking at the facts and build a basis for our theorem for the past on that, it actually, I think is getting easier, but actively reactivating the superhuman ability like Wim Hof or Stieg Severinsen of uh, your conscious control of your immune system, your ability to heat and cool your body, the ability to mm -hmm. control your inflammatory response, the ability to consciously, actively connect to a collective human consciousness, to participate um, on your personal and physical, uh, not just physical, but it, at, at the very positive gene expression level, you know, to some more primal uh, paleo, the reality is that I think that the pieces of these puzzles by having our interviews that we do with these active scientists, but also by just going with the roadmap of what have we observed? Well, we, we know that there was an advanced ancient past. We know it was worldwide. We know that there's keystone cuts. There's elements on every single continent and within our gene genome and within biological structures that more and more we're describing as biological technical switching we're like yeah it's a lot like ones and zeros and it's like no it's exactly like ones and zeros and we're really just looking at a giant world on safe mode and we're not i know the idea of mother earth and mother board the reality is that a lot of what we want to chalk up to a romantic idea of randomness I think is actually was also part of this system. And so we'll, as much as we, it makes people uncomfortable. I think that as we keep tabling the facts and I think mm -hmm. as we continue to run dialogues like this and write more and then do these specific documentaries and more produce shows on each one of these subjects, whether it's some aspect and attribute of the way our healing system works, our, cellular system works, our 
you know, like Ken Wheeler's work on magnetism, I think is so brilliant and it ties into that Karelian. It's not, it's so easy for us to say, well, oh, you're talking about herbal medicine or you're talking about homeopathy or you're, you're talking about vibrational medicine. And, and then it's really easy. All these things I'm saying can trigger some really simple things like, oh, you're, you're talking about crystals. Oh, you're talking about aliens. Oh, mm -hmm. you're talking about, and, and it's like, okay, you know, we're speaking to it from these filters that, I'm very happy Leonard Nimoy gave me from In Search of from the 70s. <laughs> I'm I'm guilty like everyone else, you know? But I think it's exciting for us to just start with like look, there's lots of shows and there's lots of things out. I think that this documentary coming out tomorrow night is mm -hmm. an opportunity for us to say, okay, here's a lot of great interesting points. Also, not only about our past, but about I, I try to poke at solutions for how we move forward to explain uh, the liquefaction of not only rock, uh, but cymatics and how do we test the soils and how do we really look at the planet when you are short for an idea and you're, and you're an, uh, here's what I'm hoping. Uh, here's one thing I'm hoping that new and young and open mind or just open-minded, not even young, new, or open-minded or newly open-minded there we go doesn't matter <laughs> yeah now i've now i've i've you've just watched me metamorph social correctness before your very eyes and for my next trick i uh, just thought you were tired like i am go ahead <laughs> right so, so i'm hoping that people with some new eyes can look at paleoanthropology archaeology and say you know, I wanted to be the guy. It's like, I have myself gone through the photos of the discovery of King Tut's tomb or think about Raiders of the Lost Ark. And you're like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, who doesn't want to like fight off Nazis and, you know, <laughs> find the tomb and save the girl. And I've talked about it before and it's like, it's so damn exciting because that discovery is out there and it's like finding the big amulet and the jewel. It doesn't sound as interesting to do 50, 80, 100 foot core samples of blown over mounds of sand in Northern Africa to find that, oh, guess what? The majority of Northern Africa is actually ancient engineered soils, but because we can do flora and fauna sampling and DNA, nuclear DNA testing, we can sort that out. And hey, Mr. Archeologist who thinks that they are waiting for a uh, the golden mummy they're never going to find you've been spending your entire career walking on top of pre-compacted multiple layered silicretes that were intentionally designed to be the foundational layer to that polygonal building that you've been walking by and you've been looking for gold and mummies and the reality is that if you started doing core sampling out by the acres and started um, taking your plugs and studying them you might find that despite all the dynastic peoples that have mutated and and repaired and adapted these ancient superstructures from an advanced ancient past mm -hmm. and no matter how we've devolved into the warlocks we've become that the reactivations and total collective awareness because we're reaching that population level again where i think we're really getting that mental ram going again collectively within that collective consciousness that one of these archaeologists will go, I got a core sampler and they don't want me to touch that ruin over there, but nobody said I couldn't do a hundred foot core sample over here. Mm -hmm. And and that is a message that does not exist in the ether. And like you said, maybe it was over eight months ago. Maybe it was almost a year now, I think. I don't know. But I started knocking on this door quietly and I'm hoping this just becomes the the piece that I put out there because it, it ha the dam has to break. It's just, we're there. And this narrative is getting really old. You know, it's like, well, there's a lot of crazy cool stuff in the ground. And the only explanation is it had to have been people helping us from somewhere else. It, all those signs and all that evidence that we come up with on a, a daily basis, really, if you're paying attention, certainly yeah. lends to the idea that there's much more going on. And you're right, narrative otherwise is getting stale. Uh, it's becoming less believable as time goes on, as more of these are presented to us, uh, again, in way of what you are talking about. Let me ask you this, because, uh, you know, myself and 
perhaps some of the people in the chat may not be very familiar with how you guys are uh, analyzing some of these core samples to determine whether it's engineered soil. What's the process in this? So it's interesting. There's uh, electro electron microscopes, uh, squids, you know, so uh, so there's a mouthful for people. Super conductor uh, interface device. A super conducting quantum interface device is a squid. And you need devices like that and electron. Here's the other problem. Electron microscopes only identify so much, which seems like literally everything because they look at everything really small. <laughs> but when when I've been saying like Terra Preta or you know just the idea of Black Earth, that's what it identifies. That's what Terra Preta. You know, it's Portuguese for basically Black Earth. It's a. Uh, it's we think of growing soils. You know, we think of oh you're you're gonna it's a black soil. You put potted stuff in it, but we're looking for any kind of quartz crushed material that makes up like when Dr. Joseph David Ovitz and the work that was done to theorize and then to test actual organics and material within Tiwanaku uh, blocks and like the, you know, the liquefaction concept of stone or softening stone softeners. But the actual work that was done to look and see, Hey, this ancient, you know, whatever, including the great pyramid, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Joseph David Oates worked on that one, that there, there is actual geopolymer patching on the Great Pyramid and at the Tiwanaku blocks. And so all over the earth, you have these geopolymers that are showing up like in the Bay at Cadiz and all of it indicates, okay, um, by looking under microscopes in testing facilities like American in, uh, Engineering, uh, there's, a, there's a company right here in St. Paul, uh, you know, Scott Walter from America Unearthed describes himself as a forensic geologist. I, his job, uh, you know, part of it is analyzing concrete and rock structures. And are they going to hold up the new parking garage that's being built? Uh, not only is what is the actual PSI of what's being poured, but identifying the geopolymers that make up the different binders that make up the different kinds of concretes. It's the same process for modern construction as it would be for looking at ancient ones. So the machining, it's not like you're going to have an electron microscope at every single site, but you're looking for laboratories just to give people an idea that are the same ones being used to test to make sure that the superstructure for the the new skyscraper that as they pull core samples as they're building, they they nobody thinks about that. Oh, if you build a new building, you don't take pieces of the building out to go make sure that they're good building. But that's mm -hmm. actually what happens with these large buildings. You actually take a sample of the concrete and you keep checking to make sure through various testing in these existing civil engineering labs, which are commercially available pretty much in every country. And they're they're using the same equipment that we could use to test ancient concretes, ancient megalithic constructions for exactly these indicators, which means that if you have the ground area outside of a structure where you're like, well, we don't want you to do destructive core sampling in the wall at Sakse Waman. Oh, okay. But do you mind if we do a, you mind if we use one of these diggers and do a 60 foot core sample in front of it? Like, how do they say no, right? Because everyone's like, well, that's just dirt. That's just sand. Well, to the naked eye. But when you start using electron microscopes and you start using squids and you start using various methodologies that are available to say, what is this material really? And you're like, what is a crushed quartz? So to give people an idea, if you get outside of Sakse Waman just a few feet and then maybe an acre and and then geologically, you're like, okay, well, we know from topography maps, if you go to become a geologist, they say, well, this happened at the end of the last epoch of ice age of this, that, or the other. And this is what mm -hmm. happened in this millions of years. And this is what happened when Pangea broke up. And, you know, they have all these stories about what happened when. And so they expect to find things at certain geological layers. And there's been more right. testing in some places, right? So what happens when you do a core sample outside of these megalithic these very advanced ancient constructions and we start finding a one inch layer 
a two foot layer, a 10 foot layer of a crushed quartz that is from a quarry a thousand miles from that site. What if there's literally, like at first they could say, oh, there's a layer of sand here that must be from a riverbed. But what happens when we start identifying that that crystalline crushed material is really a composite material that's within layering. And as and this is part of the documentary, it's explaining how footings and constructions work today so that when you're looking at these ancient structures, uh, this is way more exciting than it sounds for everyone listening, I hope, because... <laughs> The, the 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 real applicable boots on the ground drill out a core sample and say well yeah okay so we drilled into a rock that's outside of but is it a rock or is it pre-compacted material and for years just to give people an idea for those of you even if you live in a place without basements when you build a foundational wall to a home though the slab even okay did i do that what happened? Oh, no, it was really loud and scratchy. I Plenty didn't hear it. Stuff. Maybe it was oh. on my end. I didn't hear it. Perfect. So what, you know, the, the idea of um, pre-compacting the soil in order to build foundation, even for the last 30 years, it's been, well, you know, you should pre-compact it to 90%. So we are looking at people that are building these intricate, you know, razor sharp polygonal constructions but we're not thinking that the oh yeah they built the whole building on bedrock is it bedrock or just like they could move 1000 to 3000 ton stones that they shaped to raise or fit together is it possible that they actually were pre-compacting whole acres of ground and were they just doing the raw ground that was there or again are they were they importing material and just like stone spheres, a lot of the ones are hollow. And we're not talking about natural concretions, just for everyone listening. We're talking about the stone spheres that based on their shape, egg-shaped, not quite round-shaped, that, and, and irrelevant to weathering, we're talking about um, basically wave resonators. And, and would it be possible then, for instance, to do that with the ground itself? So you could have a hard spot, softer spot. And these are the kind of things that we want to dig into in other documentaries but also for people to be out there um, the missing animal is that dynastic people and it's all real exciting all human history is exciting the last few thousand years you know finding mummies super exciting gold all that stuff all the indiana jones stuff super exciting mm -hmm. but like indiana jones on steroids would be really doing a search and rescue on the connections between our dormant and or barely expressive genetic abilities with what appears to be buildings and um, plants, flauna, fauna, flora, mm -hmm. all of it working together in a system that we're just kind of starting to grasp. So that that's kind of the a taste of how we can take this documentary tomorrow and and keep a framework to mm -hmm. keep producing work that's going to go down each of these avenues from and our be, yeah and be supportive of the you know the content as it goes forward and reflective of what's already come um let me ask you a quick question and i'm, I'm very curious about this because of course you yourself are finding you know evidence of compacted ground and you know obviously the engineered soil you know there are people out there like brian foy for Jesus, Brian Forrester, who are, who are doing things that are similar. It's just, it's just being tired, guys. Sorry, that's why I stumble over the words. But, you know, it doesn't matter. We're here. That's it. We're here. That's all that matters. Um, long story short, what are some of the arguments against what you're proposing in the way of a traditional view of, you know, this soil and so forth? What are some of the explanations that have been put forth um, that describe uh, or explain why, you know, these observances might be there, but not necessarily the way that you're saying yeah, so the so ancient engineered soil like Terra Preta. Um, oh, Aaron, hi, thanks. Thank you, Aaron Morrison, for your two dollars super chat. I really appreciate yeah. it. Thank you so much for donating to the show yeah, it, and welcome to the show. And everyone listening and watching, really, it, we appreciate it. it. It 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 all of it helps. Yes. 
But with ancient engineered soil, you could say, like there is uh, carbon testing that says, okay, well, this, this soil is uh, 6,000 years old. Mm-hmm. And that's already a bad thing if you're talking about collective uh, land management where they're finding it in South America and it's outside of a where and what they thought they were even capable of doing. And so basically you have carbon dating that says, okay, well, they're just, you know, like first off, they haven't given up the Clovis first, like, you know, Graham Hancock's done his work and his book. And uh, there's been so many people. And, and again, it comes back to Michael Cremo, you know, they talk about the whole idea of the land bridge and there was nobody here 13,000 years ago. And then it's like, ah, there were people here maybe 36,000 years ago. And, you know, now we're finding literally tens of millions of people lived in the Amazon and Central America. And the extent of the empires that were here on the Americas is so beyond what they were thinking. And even Egypt itself. So the first thing that they say is, okay, well, it's all dynastic. You know, it's just... It's just local people. Uh, they burn some things. And so mm-hmm. here's, in fact, all their standard explanations are so problematic because one of them is, uh, you know, they they composted and they just had a better recipe. We just haven't figured it out yet. Well, yeah, but soil scientists have been trying to create modern biochars to mimic half or a third of what ancient engineered soils do, mm-hmm. and they can't duplicate it and they don't know what's in it. So you guys have had over 100 years and with the most modern equipment, and you can't tell us why it self-propagates. You can't, you can't, you can't make it. You're, you're getting ideas from it, but you're not making the same soil. It's kind of like, again, the, okay, well, they just uh, shaped stones. It's like, really? They picked these shapes with these size stones? because they couldn't work with the smaller material. They couldn't, they couldn't just build stuff with wood. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the, the explanations fall short at every level from their large megalithic construction work down to the soil where the explanation is just simply, well, you know, they composted what they had around them and they just tilled it and we just don't remember what it is. That's, I, I, my, my explanation of their explanation sounds so lame. I'm actually trying to make a better argument for them. I'm having a hard time, but that's your eyes cutting in and out, Jared. Is it? Check your connection real quick. I Uh-oh. lost you. And with what you're saying, we need that audio. We want to know what's next. Uh, well, <laughs> how's it now? Is it? Jared's is it on? figuring this out. I just want to say hello to a few people here. I know I'm saying hello in the chat, but it's always nice to hear your name over the airwaves. Reekin Havoc two one five. What's up, brother? Thanks for coming to the show. Samir Mo. What's up, man? Welcome back. Den Bub, what's going on, brother? Good to see you. Cashew Gusenheit, thank you so much. My rock, my left arm, and my right arm, maybe both tied together. Eric, what's going on, brother? Good to see you. And Rockstar, thanks for coming to the show. Nice to see you as well. Coral on. Always nice to see you. Of my other rock. I guess. Uh, you're not my feet. Maybe legs, you know. I need help standing up and picking things up. You guys do it all for me. <laughs> Area 503, what's up, brother? Good to see you, man, as always. And if you guys are not familiar with Area 503, you can say something at any point, Jared, to make sure it works. Uh, uh, how's it going? If you haven't seen Area 503's channel, go and check him out. He's released some pretty cool stuff, and as of late, he's been working on some music. So you guys can go and check out what he's done. And I have to tell you, some great stuff you throw it on the background while you're cleaning while you're in your car next thing you know you're bouncing along go and check out his work first floor audio what's up brother good to see you scotty b welcome to the show off world adam i don't know if i said your name but if i didn't hello good to see you as well as felicia flores good to see you love as always bethany cohen how are you welcome to the show and marvin dale nice to see you as well Sorry, we're just having a little bit of an issue with the Can audio. Can you hear me now? Uh, Jared is working on that right now. We'll get Can't right back to it, save for everything working properly the way it should. Did I forget anybody here? I know there's a lot of you uh, talking throughout me. the chat. I haven't gotten a chance hello, hello, to hello. address each one of you, but as I've gone along, I've tried to. Dark Sky Files, what's up, bro? Another fantastic channel. If you haven't seen it, 
uh, please go and check out Dark Sky Files. He releases all kinds of fantastic vintage stuff and some more modern uh, videos that you guys would certainly enjoy spanning the field. Very reflective of some of the material that we cover here at Dark Hour Paranormal. He goes in Can depth with these vintage videos, and they're awesome. Can you Jared, hear me now? Nope. I've still got nothing. I got sound on this side. Let's see. If you... If the yep, take your time. If you still can't, if you still can't be heard, just you know, type me in the uh, the private chat. I'll be able to at least know what you're saying. I can read lips, or I used to be able to a little bit, but uh, it's tough when somebody's upset and the lips are tight. You know, <laughs> he's doing fine. Uh, yes. Anyway, go and check out uh, Dark Sky Files. Fantastic. Um, this is weird. For some reason, I don't have you, Jared. I just got the message that you sent and you say that you have it it was weird what happened is it was cut cut out real quick and then it changed tonality almost like it went to a different microphone and then cut out entirely so i'm not sure what that means uh yeah try coming back in and we'll give that a go all right so he's gonna try to reboot come back in and see that we can continue on with the show jimmy mac what's up brother good to see you as always and I think that's about that's as far back as the chat chat's gonna let me go here. So uh, hey, listen once again, unidentified S four. What's up, bro? Good to see you, Damian. Honor, nice to see you. I saw Damian K in here earlier. What's going on, man? If you're still here, uh, yeah, I don't know what the hell I was gonna say. I was saying something, but we'll get there. <laughs> How do we have? Can you hear me now? Nope, I still got nothing on you. What? Nothing. What a weird thing to happen. Hey, Tina Mobley, what's going on? Very nice to see you. Hey, guess what? Unfortunately, tonight when I was putting on my uh, sweatshirt before the show, um, I was trying to shift the lock into the back uh, on the necklace, and the, the necklace part actually broke. So for the time being, until I can get that fixed, it's on my small altar uh, in front of me, which I look at every time I do shows. So certainly. Nope, got nothing, Jared. So certainly, if you guys get a chance, go down in the description and check out uh, Tina Mobley's fantastic jewelry. Uh, this is a, an organite piece that she's made for me. It's got amethyst in it, rose quartz, some gold flecks, and of course, this beautiful copper spiral in the back. I know it's a little difficult to see. I don't know if... Nope, that's probably not going to make a difference, but we'll we'll try it. The hell, it works for everybody, yes? <laughs> it's got be my camera this is a new camera by the way too i hope you guys are enjoying how this is coming in justin good good earth you can still hear jared you can that is very strange i really can't explain that um let's try let's try something here uh da, 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 da. Let me see if I can do something. And if this comes through, something to work with. What the? F hmm. Oh, that's curious. All right, let's give this a go. Sorry, this is happening, guys, but we're we're getting there. Uh, I don't know what the hell happened. If it's on my end, if you guys can hear him. Then it has to be on my end, but it's nothing apparent. I assume you can all hear me, because if you couldn't, I'm sure somebody would have said something in the chat. Prairie Fire, what's up, dude? It's been a very long time since I've seen you, man. It's really great to see you again. I often think about some of you guys that, you know, dissipate. Uh, can you guys hear Jared at this point? If you can, I'm going to have to do something else. I'm going to have to try something else. You can hear both, but I can't hear Jared. Okay. Jared, hang tight for a minute. I'm going to do the old coming in and out. And uh, so stick around. Be right back.
Okay. So, what's the consensus? Can you guys, you guys can hear can, Jared? Can you hear oh, me now? I can. What the hell did you just do? I don't know. I did don't you know. do something? I don't think so. Did you touch something? Witchcraft is a okay. real thing. That's Dark really hour. interesting. I can hear you loud and clear now. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. Thanks for sticking with us. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry about that, everyone. All right. So, yeah, I was, I think I was chatting, but I may have just been staring at the screen and everyone just wasn't getting hand singles. So, I'm. Well, we can hear you loud and clear now, and that's where, beautiful. Where did it cut out for everyone I don't still remember. engaged? I so, I think remember. we were talking about like, <laughs> I just, I think that there is just ground, like the, the, what are the poo poos of, how can they explain this away? And even in trying to make a good argument for them, uh, there is no explanation as to one, they can't duplicate bioengineer. The biochars today are nothing like ancient biochars. They can't, they can't duplicate them. Secondly, there just seems to be an avoidance of testing the biochars and saying, okay, well, how old is this? And the problem is it's mixed with younger stuff where dynastic people have come in and, you know, they've continued to do the work of Terra Preta to man manage it. So they're tilling it and they're mixing in their materials. So there's definitely going to be some, uh, I don't know, contamination from multiple dynastic generations. So, mm -hmm. you know, how low do you got to go to get to the origin that likely is also suffering from rain? You know, there's bleeds in the data with other generations of, uh, information where it might be more difficult, but it's just one of those rabbit holes people will have to go down. But you could explain it away and just say, well, you know, maybe it's 6,000 years old, but you just have to not do any other testing to say that that's true or accept, you know, your first test result and not test it twice. There's that. But we, we have too many out of place, out of time things like the Paracas, the shape mm -hmm. of their skulls the other blood sampling from South America that doesn't make any sense. You know, that was done in the seventies. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. you know, we don't have a narrative that works for what's there, but it doesn't prove out that there's only one other narrative. It's just the jump goes, we have a long way to go to stop jumping from, okay, well we didn't make it. So it's gotta be aliens. Well, That's... I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, I think today, yes, we'll entertain that notion certainly, but it goes much deeper. It's a much more complex analysis and way of conjecture than perhaps just saying it's it's aliens or you know something along those lines. Simplified, uh, you know, we've talked many times about how some of these ancient people may have been influenced outside of themselves and their societies and cultures by more advanced uh, races or species. Perhaps this was more commonplace back then. Uh, it was said that there was a time, and I don't have the research for you right now to back this up. This is something that I had come across uh, in my research. And they had mentioned that there was a time, perhaps around Atlantis or you know something along those lines, wherein we decided to start experimenting with uh, crossing our genetic material with animal material. And whether this was a physical endeavor or not, I honestly couldn't tell you because at that time we were also supposedly somewhat interdimensional as well as physical, which is another thought considering of, you know, all the cryptids that we see or don't see and, you know, the, how we think that they may have that particular component to their uh, overall being. Um, what we got were some of these mythological creatures of today. So, for example, the Minotaur, or, um, you know, any of these half-human, half-animal uh, entities uh, and icons, they actually, it, again, this is what I've, I've found, this is certainly something we've tried, and the reason that we abandoned it is because we realized that it didn't do anything to raise our consciousness level, which is what I think we were after, in doing these sort of experiments, whereas today we might just blindly and empirically try something to see the end result, not really having uh, a clue what might come about. But back then they uh, very purposely had taken the time to do these experiments, realize that it wasn't a good uh, part of the evolution and way of where we wanted to go. And so, you know, again, we have a very different and dynamic set of components in front of us when it comes to analyzing the history uh, wherein, again, there may have been some influence by extraterrestrials, but 
we're still looking at the people that created this or what's left of their design. Do you um, do you think they were link looking for anything in particular? In doing those experiments? Yeah. Uh, and honestly, from what I understand, it was just an endeavor to see if, you know, taking on those two kinds of bodies, let's say, uh, a human body with a horse body, if you were to merge the two, would you be able to hold a different consciousness level than possibly you could in the human body that you have or just in the horse body? Apparently, it was more deleterious than anything in way of their findings, and a lot of this didn't really work out. I don't know what that means in way of detail, but long story short, it's not something that we've done anymore, but that memory still remains within us, and perhaps they created some even more otherworldly things, such as what we consider a monster to be today. I mean, we just don't know. But these are some things that people have said, maybe as we go forward in time in archaeological sense, we'll find evidence for some of this backing it up. And I say that with some hope. And the reason I do is because, uh, and you'll probably be able to quote this a little bit better in way of where this happened. But I think it was about 20 years ago, they had found those little skeletons in a cave in Africa, where this particular place was supposedly where the uh, Nephilim had been mining for gold and had created human beings that didn't have any sexual capability or emotional uh, understanding, literally programmed into them physically and otherwise to just, you know, be slaves. This is uh, certainly a thought that people have had in way of our own origin, where we came from, what our purpose was, and why we're here today. But again, my whole point in saying this and bringing it up is that this is a, another bit of evidence that was brought forth that still coincides with some of the legends, theories, and the stories that have been passed down. And we've all said, oh, that must be fantasy. Oh, the Roman gods and Greek gods, there was no, no reality to back that. But we're seeing something else or being told something else in way of what that actually means for us. I, I think one of the things that really I'm hoping to unpack for everyone um, and really get a paradigm shift on is the reason we're so anchored in these stories is because we think that they're ancient. We think that 6,000 years ago, or we think that, you know, just the idea of the Greeks coming about and who were the Etruscans and where was Tartaria and what was going on in the East and when was modern society around the time of Sumeria? What, how did this all, you know, who were the sea people and how, you know, we have this idea that that was a long time ago. And so we look back at these myths and we look at Solon and his visit with the Egyptians talking about the nations of the Atlanteans and that there was 10 cities or nine cities or whatever. And, you know, that there was, um, a very, they were very advanced. And, and then we, and what we do is we keep piecing together a story that says, you know, something happened post flood when in reality, these megalithic structures, the weathering of these stones and mother nature is one hell of a thing when it comes to erosion and water is so powerful, but mm -hmm. it really looks like most of these structures predate the younger Dryas, many of them. I don't mean they're, Conf you know, not their conformities right now, but the large megalithic blocks, like at Baalbek, the Great Pyramid, they really seem to look like they're probably pre Younger Dryas. And let's just say they're not. But what I'm really trying to get everyone's head around is when we have stories of reincarnation and centaurs and the idea of the Greek gods, but the mythos that is in slivers of truths, the idea of feng shui in the East. There are a million different examples of where we've deified or mystified what was once maybe a technology. Yes. yes. And, and that, right? So that means that if we were an advanced human race, so we know, and Michael Cremos for Bidden Archaeology is a great resource of just revisiting existing paleoanthropological finds showing humanity going way outside of the evolutionary process that they explained it. So we have it in our minds to say exactly what you just did, which uh, earlier, and it's not a wrong assumption. It's it, it, you have to force it out of your head of, well, yeah, we, we, we evolve and everything's been on a lineal course. Like there was a, somebody flicked a marble and everything's been going that way, whatever it is. 
it's on an evolutionary track or it's a, a pulse. It's a beat. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, global Side warming. Wave. You know, it sucks or it goes sideways or somebody ate that thing. So now there's only one left. You know, the the far side cartoon of the dinosaurs not making the Ark of the Covenant, you know, or the Ark. <laughs> sorry. You know, like the, yes. they were, we're late. And then, you know, so so the idea of uh, combining humans and the uh, the legends of, well, maybe that was a time where we were trying to reach consciousness. So this is a good example of we have only so much understanding of uh, human abilities. We see a legend, uh, a, a mythos that says something that maybe the truth is, hey, maybe maybe we were trying to experiment to become two things. But that's within the timeline we described ourselves in. We're talking about a timeline of tens of thousands of years of advanced humanity where right now we have gene crispers that you and I could do horrible things in our garage already. I mean, we can literally buy a gene crisper. We can do things at our homes with genes. Yeah. I mean, get your head around that. And 3D printing, cellular printing. I mean, there are things that we can do now, but if you were a society that could be a giant, be a midget, uh, change a hand, rebuild a hand, do anything genetically already and not with 10 or 15 percent consciousness 100 percent consciousness so the idea that we're looking at legends that refer to an interpretation or an entertainment or a mythos from a group of people that we're wearing you know like in you know are the stereotypical socrates versus an advanced human society that's measuring the sounds, frequencies, and energies of the earth, terraforming and building constructions that are not only blocking earthquakes, but managing communications between constructions directly with humans, active third eye, actual Mm -hmm. conscious collective human consciousness, not unconscious collective human consciousness, along with abilities like synesthesia where we're seeing, feeling, smelling and experiencing each other's thoughts maybe by at will or by choice and so the idea of being a centaur the idea of being a griffin the idea of being pick your magical uh house on the rock uh merry-go-round character for all of those that don't know the house on the rock is worth going to but this is um the concepts that we've dumbed it down so far to go well things evolve and we must have wanted to try to be centaurs because, well, I can move really fast and I might be smarter and I could play better chess. Maybe that's it, <laughs> you know? And I just gave you the baseline for painting any oil of the romantic period. And yeah, pretty much he did. So there, there's where it's like, all of that makes sense. You know, when we say it like that, it, it, oh yeah, yeah. You know, that's, that's it. We were trying to raise our consciousness. And so, we get caught constantly. I think I get caught in this thought cycle where I have grown up reading all this, a lot of not accurate natural history museum, you know, everyone's in a loincloth banging rocks together stories that then affect my vision on our past where I'm building a hypothesis ignoring the facts that if you want to combine a centaur and a human or to make a centaur to combine a horse and a human perhaps it's more of the malleability and the power of programming the human cellular system to not have cancer to grow bigger or smaller based on your job career whatever it is an indefinite lifespan with a completely manageable re generative cellular system that could also mutate or morph in what would look now like a superhero movie the reality may have been exactly what that's what we've fictionalized and made into yet another mythos in the marvel world is really just a really poor interpretation of these superhuman abilities that again aren't so crazy when you say okay fact humans have been on the planet much longer than it doesn't matter that we're not saying that the the concept of the of the science of evolution that this item started here with a tail and here it was walking but it was like a cat on four legs to a cat walking 
and you go, well, that was a progression and that was nature. Well, mm -hmm. if it's not being mindfully directed and it's gone from four legs to two, was it an improvement because we're projecting, well, bi bipedal is definitely better and or or it went from four legs to eight legs. I mean, but we're projecting a, uh, a, a shift and saying, OK, this evolutionary window is a natural process that has nothing to do with a biosphere that's part of a giant motherboard that's in safe mode that this is what happens when it's not thinking, when it's not connected, when they're not interacting, when trees and plants and animals and the engineered soils are not all functioning together. This is what you get in a chaotic system. It, it's like, you know, again, what are the slivers of truths in the Bible about at one point we could talk to animals, like straight up talk to animals. So, they're, right. Right. Ooh, the, I mean, yep. Mr. Mr. D.B. Cooper. Yes, I want to address this very quickly, but I didn't want to. I didn't want to stop you. Well, anyway, that was just that. But I, I think it's it's good for us to look at these myths and legends and go, "Hey, were we once these two things together, mm -hmm. or is that just an imagination?" Very good one of the time period of those dynastic peoples, and it's a time when their genetic memories and their instincts and their maybe even some of their observable phenomena in the day, which we would have labeled as alien or, or godlike, where some of these advanced ancient humans have survived and those abilities like, well, couldn't space traveling aliens really be us and they come back to the planet? Yeah, exactly. Right. But we're, we're making an assumption that they're alien either to the planet or that they're alien to us or that they're relatives and they're not us. And I right. and I hate describing ourselves as like the warlocks of this Jules Verne novel, but it's th this is us with those like the news about the silicretes in the stone, you know, the Stonehenge right behind you. I mean, it's ninety seven point seven percent crystalline silicrete, and that's a crazy coincidence. But anyway, you were going to say something about Mister D B Cooper. Yes, I am. Uh, right before I get to that, because holy shit here. Um, let me just say this imagination, yeah. as I, you know, understood it growing up, this is something that, you know, obviously doesn't exist, you can imagine it, you can create it in a sense. But as I've gotten older, and more savvy of the third dimensional in general, I realize that every thought that you have manifests on some level. So to me, yeah. imagination is just that manifested thought form that you have. If you put more into it, you would uh, potentially manifest it the way that you see it. Mr. Oh, D.B. Yeah. Cooper 77. Number one, thank you so much for your $5 super chat here and here and Oh, Jesus, I don't I've lost the ball. Hold on. <laughs> and, well, you know what? As I'm doing this, I want to I want to read as he's saying. I mean, dude, it's nice to see you again, by the way. We've missed you. Uh, you know, I, again, recognize some of the guys that I see in the chat tonight, and I haven't seen you for some time, whether it's on this show or others that we've frequented. So it's really awesome to see you, and thank you for joining us. Uh, he says, great show, brother. And then, hello, beautiful people in the chat. Thank you for the other five dollars there my friend and says keep doing what you do mike and believe me my friend i am without any stall oh, god i could say this better i will never stop doing this work and i really really appreciate you seeing what we do uh you know not only myself but what jared's doing what third phase of moon's doing what gufan's doing dr j radio live apollo stereo doc scanner you name it what we're all trying to work on together, and I appreciate so much your support. And of course, I could never forget Gigi Abby Lynn. Thank you so much for the five dollars and fifty-five cent super chat. It says great interview. Thanks. Now, when I see five five five, 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 five. <laughs> when I see those numbers together, it always means to me there's going to be some sort of shift, but usually in a positive way. But growth is at the helm. That's what I've always taken it as. And once again, Mr. D.B. Cooper with the Superman icon, which oh. I guess is very, very appropriate for this individual. And he is the Italian-looking stallion. I don't think he's Italian, but he looks Italian, and he sounds, well, I don't know if it's, he sounds Italian, but he's got that real sheen. What would I call him? 
uh, the Italian Johnny Bravo or something along those lines, mate. <laughs> it's been a while since we've talked D.B. Cooper. We should catch up again, man. Thank you so much for your super chats, guys. Oh, my Christ. Mr. D.B. Cooper. <laughs> Imagination the is everything. Thank you so much for the... Well, I think you're up to about 30 now. Thank you for the $30 super chat collectively, mate. My God, thank you all. Uh, were, were you trying to shoot for the Billy Joel, uh, keep my hair in a pompadour like the rest of the Romeos wore? <laughs> no, but you know what? That's very appropriate and works perfectly. Fits like a puzzle piece there. Man, that's... Uh, uh, Jesus, I'm just uh, beside myself. Thank you so much, guys. But again, as Jared mentions, all of this goes right back into what we're doing, whether it's traveling to different locations, whether it's planning a trip to Hawaii, which I'm planning for, uh, I think it's I think it's March. I'm pretty sure it's either the end of February oh. or March. So, yeah, I've already put in time for that, so I'm, I'm saving up for sure. this now. But you guys really do help us. And, of course, again, your presence, your attendance, your participation yeah. in the shows is very paramount it's paramount to what we do and of course yeah. if you guys have questions as i mentioned before put them in capital letters yeah. over in the chat and we will address what you're asking um i wanted to ask you one thing very quickly here because i know we're getting close to time but you know something that's always sort of intrigued me is the idea that possibly some of these structures that we see today that have been left over uh were created with materials that they had at that time and perhaps as things have gone on are not available to us perhaps because of environmental shifts uh some sort of uh, cataclysmic event that occurs something yeah. along those lines uh, is there any type of material or substances that has been observed in these uh, architectures that we can solidly say that particular uh plant that they ground up to make that mortar doesn't exist anymore or anything like that some of it the assumption is that they were just working with rock and that they like the even the concept you know uh, dr joseph david ovitz the idea of geopolymers in the great pyramid it's not that the pyramid was poured but there are there is geopolymer patching and so they've done he's done that testing but the monuments behind you, for instance, at Stonehenge are another good example. They did a core sample of one of the Sarsen stones in 1957-56. And they finally just released that paper that I think was a huge deal. And they said, you know, that's a 97.7% silicrete. And why would you use a silicrete uh, for the original Sarsen stones? And then all around the planet, there is keystone cuts. No material science has looked into exactly what is in the keystone uh, metal bars that have been found. And the combination of the shapes of polygonal walls, no one has really analyzed, okay, how does that shape work with earthquakes that are like 30 miles below the surface, 100 miles deep this direction? Like, why that pattern? why that shape of a stone sphere why you know like there there is just commonsensical work that is just laying in the sheer open just there for someone to take it and analyze it and mm -hmm. and what's worse um about the living entity of humanity in reference to that collective consciousness is something you said earlier which is manifestation um is a real tool that we had and i often wonder if the net net of why that ancient society globally fell wasn't a catastrophe that was external or that it was a a war i wonder if it wasn't some collective uh agreement in consciousness where they manifested some really dark um creatures I, mm -hmm. not as in they grabbed them from the nether worlds but through their own collective manifestations they created they created something bad and that's a possibility well let me say this real quick because i keep going back to this experience for some reason i'm always led back to montauk um duncan cameron <laughs> had mentioned yeah when he was asked about how he had created the entity known as junior which sabotaged not only the base but the entire project itself this 12 foot 10 12 foot being uh actually i think there were reports up to 16 or 18 feet depending on who you asked who had okay. actually seen it and survived um you know this big mass of lumbering negativity darkness it looked like a sasquatch to the naked eye apparently wow. um 
one of the things that he had said, because the story went as as such, you know, he was programmed and done. He did this very intentionally with uh, so, uh, several other people to be able to bring forth this particular creature when he was sitting in the chair that allowed him to manifest thought like this. So the idea was that he'd get a trigger word, and from that, whoop, this thing would spring forth, and it would manifest in the underground and start wreaking havoc. Uh, what ended up happening is he was able to manifest it, as we understand, but it showed up somewhere outside, above ground, on the base, and just started destroying things. Now, again, when he was asked how this actually came to pass, he was very hesitant to go into certain detail because he claimed he was still continuing to research how this was possible and how much part he actually had in it because the idea was proposed that perhaps when he went into this meditation or he was already there and the trigger word was mentioned yes he was putting forth imagined energy but he also believed that he might have tapped into something else that just complemented uh, through his suggestion of bringing this open he opened a window wherein he pulled in either some energy from this to support what he was manifesting or it was part of a very deep part of his manifestation whatever this foreign outside energy was coming from a different dimension so I, I thought I'd mention that because these are esoteric practices you know that were used in the Montauk project that you know mainly dealt with the body yes technology was used you know in its entirety but really it came back to the human being being the driving element behind the um, desired effects of their experiments so to hear you say well possibly they manifested some sort of creature or they manifested some sort of uh, event that you know would be unfamiliar with us today we you know number one not understand how we were doing it because perhaps then we were more in tune with that you know thought manifesting of course if you're closer in vibration to the fourth dimension in any way you're manifesting things that much quicker so you know just to say and not to get too off topic but just to mention if you're working with meditation exclusively every single day you're taking that time and you're raising your vibration don't be surprised that whatever you start to think of you manifest much quicker and i think we've all seen little bursts and jaunts of this in our life and say well how do we hold on to that but you know then struggle to do so again it's it's all the sine wave of experience you know, raising vibration, lowering vibration based on what you're doing, you're eating, you're sleeping, you're thinking, you name it, all of those factors come into play. So, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to get off track there, but that's, no, but that's what you reminded me of. No, but that's that's dead on. What if, again, I've, I've made the argument that, you know, people always remember they were Cleopatra. They never build a crap scooper at the Roman Zoo. You know, they were always somebody <laughs> cool, you know. And then there are people who will say, no, I was a farmer. And then they go find the farm and it's really there. And it's like 3,000 years old. I mean, that does come up. But in the world of collective memory where I one of the things I say is, you know, hey, we don't, the theory goes is that, you know, we have junk genes. And I'm like, you guys literally just said, you know, this much of the human brain and now you're telling me that you got 6,000 junk genes. I mean, perhaps they're part of the zip files that contain the total living consciousness of the human race and the ability to unzip or unlock um, those stored humanities or et cetera, et cetera. But one of the things that does occur to me is if we are able to recall, not that, for instance, Cleopatra, what if you're not recalling Cleopatra that you were, but what if you're recalling her memories because it's part of that collective write read disc and you're able to connect into uh, her experience or who she is or who she still exists in the total ether. But it does occur to me that we know we've done experiments. We know that we can pass memories directly to children we know that this is an actual possibility that you can actually as a mother father through genetic uh transfer transfer mm -hmm. actual straight memories which we end up describing as in as uh instincts sometimes but i mean actual like this event happened on this particular day um well, i remember the event kind of gen that's we've been going down that rabbit hole now for a few years that they've been proving it in lesser creatures through experiments. So I'm going to bring up a common one for a lot of people, that fear that you get where you start walking but have to run out of a basement. Mm -hmm. You know that one? And mm -hmm. you're like, the hair stand on your arms, and you're like, even with the lights on, you just find yourself like going from like walking to like just running out, you know, like going faster out of the basement. 
and we think, yeah, that's one hell of an instinct. But you know, for all the rock cut tunnels and the systems like Muhammad Ibrahim has talked about all over Egypt, the amount of tunnel systems all across Europe that are rock cut, laser cut, like I mean, they're not, I'm not saying so they were cut by lasers like Johnny Quest style. I'm just saying <laughs> very detailed precision. How long were we underground and what the hell was chasing people that that is an outstanding global phenomena, I think, about, well, yeah, you know, caves are dark and creepy, so people don't like being in them. I think that memory ties to a period of sheer collective terror. Well, I don't they, think they it's also just... mentioned. Well, they also mentioned that, you know, some of these species that supposedly resemble us or share certain traits that live within the, the cavernous earth, uh, that they're able to live and sustain themselves the way that they have because they actually walked away from the sun. Now, to us, it sounds kind of crazy because we need the vitamin D at the very least. And, you know, mm -hmm. everything that we do really revolves around the sun in so many ways. Uh, I have trouble stomaching the idea that our natural existence is to be in some sort of darkness or a uh, fluorescent light of sort like it just it doesn't yeah. seem doesn't seem Lab appropriate animals. to me yeah we have something <laughs> no, like I, this but you know i i God. think what it really you know i think you're dead on but i i think so here's what happens is that one of the things you have to keep unpacking is the length of human history and was there one advanced ancient world society or was it more than one was it multiple rises and falls and i don't mean like primitively like just oh everyone on the continent everyone everywhere is wearing blue jeans no not like that but mm -hmm. was it a million years ago was it a half a million years ago was it within the sumerian kings list was it 265 was that the beginning or an end of an epoch uh, of of advanced human living so we don't we don't have those answers we know that there's anatomically correct humans dating back well before what we're saying modern humanity existed we know that there was a larger and global human population building with almost indestructible silicretes like the ones behind you to geo advanced geopolymers because we've done some of the testing and just scratching the surface we know that there's this global phenomena of it so between manifestations of our own cre creating and again knowing the length of time that we were here mm -hmm. if we relate to that first we won't as frequently jump to the conclusions that oh well the minotaur thing makes sense because you know it, in a very small window in the last fifty thousand years or hundred thousand years we go yeah well we were experimenting with evolution but that may have nothing to do with the larger story of well no there was a global fully conscious connected conscious society that was communicating with animals that mm -hmm. did have a different relationship with the physical world that was using building materials that not only see we're thinking natural the question itself we're so programmed like when you say hey what kind of building materials part of that question is loaded in that you're thinking wood you're thinking gold platinum metals mm -hmm. well whatever metals woods you know you're thinking of like these are things that we build with not and, and that's if you're really getting out there most of the time it would just be hey i wonder if half the reason the grand canyon's missing is because they were using it to build megalithic structures that have somehow all weathered away or turned to dust we don't have i mean we found some wood statues like in russia i think the oldest one now is close to sixteen thousand years i know they have it down as twelve thousand eight to sixteen thousand years for a uh a window for the carbon dating uh it was found in a bog there's been a few wooden uh like almost totem poles found but we don't know what was on top of these Sakse womans you know we look at it and go oh it was a walled city you, you mean to say that they can cut 800 ton to 50 ton blocks on 27 sides and put them together you can't put a piece of paper between them but they didn't know how to cut large trees and so when we think of materials then it's even hard for us to think of, oh, most of the planet had giant redwoods and sequoias or meta sequoias that the entire map of the world that everybody looks left to right of America at one end and, you know, China and Japan at the other end. You know, when we look at that map, 
the majority of that map and I I have that included. It's on the notaliens.com website on the memory area, but this sequoias uh, and these giant redwoods, that was the majority of forests for a long period of time. And we look at these little trees and we go, well, these are trees, but we're making an assumption that the materials they were using, if they were building an advanced society and it was pre younger dryas, and if it was pre Mount Toba exploding, how much of anything survives after 80,000 years? It's an mm -hmm. exception to become a fossil. It's an exception to be preserved That's a of good anything. Point, but that, yeah. So, and if you were more advanced, how, how bio, look, I'm not a huge fan of biodegradable straws. I'll tell you that right now. It's like, wow, I have paper mush in my mouth and it's sort of sucking liquid, <laughs> you know, and for everyone out there, I have sustainable mugs and I prefer to use uh, stainless steel straws. So I don't do that. But in the world of like disposable earth friendly material, this advanced human race may have been using those even for building constructions. So we may be left with what are really the tanks of their biggest or largest or most important constructions. And when we look at things like Tiwanaku, Sacsayhuaman, the Great Pyramid, Angkor Wat, when we look at all these places, we think, well, clearly they finished these precision uh, buildings with whole logs and grass roofs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they did it in loincloths. <laughs> and, and, it, and it's such a bizarre abstract image. It's just annoying to not acknowledge the tools and the precision instruments it would take to figure out what pattern to put in those polygonal walls. And when we start looking at weird cuts in our DNA that are genetically, they, there's literally geneticists that have looked at like this cut is ancient, but it ain't natural. And then there's been some shows even early on going, oh, it's a mystery. And then it gets, it, it the, the light never stays on it. And that's the, one of the future focuses of doing more of these shows and more of these dialogues is to keep people focused on the relevant facts so that instead of as much as I used to love doing it, thinking about Sinbad and, you know, claymation from the sixties and Greek and Titans and fill in the blank to move past these mythos to really recovering what could be a reactivation necessary for me to meditate through cancer, connect with you mm -hmm. directly, actually open portals that or, or mind states that do allow us to connect through an infinite amount of space or whatever dimensionally that really means. And, you know, frequencies, cymatics, that's where it's all at. Mr. D.B. Cooper, 775555. <laughs> Mr. DB Cooper 77 killing it tonight on the super chat. Of course, thank you all of you for your donations. Mr. DB Cooper, man, you're bringing down the house this evening, and I really appreciate that, brother. Thank you so much. He says, energy never dies. Well, as far as we can observe, that's absolutely true. Uh, you know, I think we're going to find some inversions of energy as we go forth, which may make it appear to disappear from our perception but uh you're right we know that energy uh, cannot be created nor destroyed i mean we hear this so often we were taught this uh you know growing up in our, our school systems and it still holds true today unlike some of the other theories that perhaps we've learned and have discussed since and realized that perhaps they didn't hold up as much uh listen jared we're getting close to the bottom of the yeah. hour but i wanted to reiterate the most important aspect of doing this show tonight, and that is that you are having your premiere tomorrow of this documentary, TerraCore. What was the, uh, uh, let's see here, sorry. TerraCore, Our Ancient Past Revealed, Discovering Our Lost History. And again, you guys will be able to find that at 11 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. Now, 10 8 central. o'clock, 10 central and 8 o'clock Pacific Time. Uh, tomorrow night. It's going to be fantastic. I'll certainly be there. Jared will also, of course, be there. Yeah. And I hope to see a lot of you joining us as well. It's a 40-minute documentary, and uh, you guys are really going to love what he's put together. And, of course, the musical score is fantastic, if I do say so myself. All him. Uh, <laughs> but I appreciate that. Yeah. And uh, listen, yeah, if there's anything else you'd like to say to us, Jared, uh, please, I implore you to do it now. 
Yeah, I appreciate everyone participating. And look, this is a start. It's a start that um, this, it's not like we haven't had the dialogue and it's not like there isn't material out there, but I really hope that this documentary is just a start. It's just a handshake. It's just an introduction for being able to like, not only draw new people into it, but for you to just start as another guide to really jumping paradigms and doing what we really need to do, which is treat our history as the search and rescue, not the search and recovery that it is. I like and that. You're, and, and, and really, I, I have to say thank you to you. The music, uh, uh, yeah, I know this is not gratuitous for everyone listening, but Michael's compositions are brilliant. Uh, I did not need to use all of Michael's music it just happened that all of Michael's music. <laughs> yeah. It's your music is so good, man. Oh, thanks, and, man. I appreciate you, dude. <laughs> but yeah, so there is a 40 minute documentary and all the music in the background was composed by our host tonight. Thank and you so much, Jared. I, well, I really appreciate it. Thank you for uh, collaborating with me on that. Thank you for everyone who's given uh, dark hour, a super chat tonight and participated just, joining in with us and supporting the channel. Um, none, of, none of that and the work, honestly, really, I mean, when you, when, you, when you combine the documentary with the music, it's a whole element that it just wouldn't be the same. And that support you guys give us, it contributes greatly to producing this and future works. You're absolutely right. I thank you so much, brother. And I look forward to seeing this with you and everybody else. Uh, it is a new experience to, you know, go to a screening when something like this happens. And that's essentially what you guys are doing. You're coming to the screening. Uh, it, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's really cool. And if you put it that way, it's even cooler. But uh, and that being said, I'm going to take you yeah. off for a moment. I'll say, uh, I'll close out the show and then come back and say my proper goodbyes as always. Thank you so much, Jared. Thank you. Now, one of the things I wanted to mention very quickly about this documentary and the way that Jared speaks, okay? Yes, when we're on the show, we are covering many different topics and we are sometimes going at lightning speed, putting a little assumption behind in what we're, we're speaking of, saying to ourselves as we go along, you know, we're introducing this concept. We sort of trust perhaps some people to understand what that is without going into detail, but... When it comes to the documentary that he put together, uh, and obviously, as I mentioned, I have seen it already, fantastic work, he expresses these concepts in depth and in detail, but in a way that is very palatable and understandable. You can comprehend what he's saying. So it's an easy listen. You guys will very much enjoy it. Nothing's going to go above your heads in way of, uh, you know, what he puts forth and believe me in the world of archeology span and understanding some of, uh, again, the concepts, excuse me, that are put forth. Uh, sometimes you have to have quite an extensive background to really get into it and intellectualize some of these concepts. And yet Jared, the way that he presents it and the delivery really puts it in the seat of your lap and you, you certainly get as much from it as you possibly can. And I hope that tomorrow night you guys get as much out of this documentary that I have as I have. Sorry for stumbling over my words. I'll get used to this, you know, time change here, but again, long story short, uh, it's a fantastic production and I certainly encourage you guys to come out tomorrow night and come check it out with us very quickly. And certainly, nevertheless, Mr. DB Cooper with another $5 super chat brother from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much. And it's fantastic to see you here along with Prairie Fire I saw earlier too. Uh, we, I haven't seen these folks for quite some time and it's, it, again, just fantastic to have you joining us tonight. So in the meantime, I should probably get the iPhone. This always happens. I mean to set up the outro and I get so involved in the topic at large that uh, it just goes right by me and I find myself closing out the show and nothing's queued up. So give me just a moment here. I'll give you a little music for your way out. And for those of you who don't know, uh, I did compose the music in the beginning of the show as well as the end here. And I actually didn't, I, I was putting together an instrumental album back in 2006. Yes, yeah, it's quite some time ago. But um, the way that sampling was viewed at the time and the art form that it is was very much frowned upon. There was a, 
a certain court case back in 2005, which deemed that you really can't use anything, no matter what it is, without permission. And the way we were getting by it is to take uh, perhaps a, a snare hit, or we take a, a line from a violin, and you might throw it backwards, and you might change the pitch of that snare drum, but they were coming after us. And even the album that I had released prior to this, uh, which was... Uh, a fantastic hit to be honest with you i was receiving cease and desist orders uh and so therefore there wasn't much i could do with that so i put this together up for you we're almost there i want to thank once again all of my super chatters and my moderators and most importantly each one of you that has joined us tonight and when we see you it's just an exciting time to have you here thank you so much for being with us guys I really appreciate it. And I'll just let you know very quickly that I have Elisa Madhus coming on Wednesday. And then I have Long Island Bigfoot coming on Thursday. So keep your eyes out for those. The promotional links will be up very shortly. And you guys will see that. In fact, I think I'm putting together Elisa's tonight. And then I'm working on Dr. J Radio Live's channel. Let's go over there and check out some of his recent interviews and check out his shorts because they are fantastic and it's easy to forget how many people notable people that dr j has interviewed over the years uh certainly just as relevant some of these interviews as they were back then they are still today at any rate guys we're going to close out for the night in the meantime stay inquisitive stay powerful and continue to do your research <laughs> <laughs> oh boy it's almost time for bed almost have a good night we'll see you next time on dark hour paranormal ciao